Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to morning prayer on this Wednesday of the week of the second Sunday after Pentecost, year B. I thank you very much for having me and for this privilege to do the service this morning. I trust that all is well. Our readings this morning from the Old Testament, the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, 1 to 15, and from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, 1 to 12. The appointed Psalm, Psalm 119, verses 49 to 72, and we use the proper form. Please join us in our opening hymn. Our service continues from page 34 of your Book of Common Prayer and then into 35 and following. But the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed be the Lord our God, by whose grace we are yet alive. Blessed be his Son, Jesus Christ, by whose rising we are set free. Blessed be the Spirit of God, in whom is our hope and our joy. Father, we come together in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, to offer your worship, praise, and thanksgiving. To you belong all power and glory. You are the source of all goodness. Let the worship bear witness to your peace and saving power. Through your Spirit, may we ever rejoice in the abiding presence of our risen and ascended Lord. Amen. The Jubilati. O shout to the Lord in triumph, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his face with songs of joy. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Come into his gates with thanksgiving, 
and in this cause we praise. Give thanks to him and bless his holy name. For the Lord is good. His loving mercy is forever. His faithfulness throughout all generations. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning is now and shall be forever. Amen. And now let us with humility approach God's throne of mercy, seeking his forgiveness, even for those things for which our consciences are afraid. Lord, we pray to you for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone, and so hold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in the newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Psalm 119, beginning at verse 49. Remember your word to your servant, because you have given me hope. This is my comfort and my trouble, that your promise gives me life. The proud have derided me cruelly, but I have not turned from your law. When I remember your judgments, O Lord, O Lord, I take great comfort. I am filled with a burning rage because of the wicked who forsake your law. Your statutes have been like songs to me wherever I have lived as a stranger. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and dwell upon your law. This is how it has been with me, because I have kept your commandments. You only are my portion, O Lord. I have promised to keep your words. I entreat you with all my heart, be merciful to me according to your promise. I have considered my ways and turn my feet towards your decrees. I hasten and do not tarry to keep your commandments. Though the cords of the wicked entangle me, I do not forget your law. At midnight I will rise and give you thanks because of your righteous judgments. I am a companion of those who fear you and those who keep your commandments. The earth, O Lord, is full of your love. Instruct me in your statutes. O oh Lord, you have dealt graciously with your servant according to your word. Teach me discernment and knowledge, for I have believed in your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and you bring forth good. Instruct me in your statutes. The proud has snared me with lies, but I will keep your commandments with my whole heart. Their heart is gross and fat, but my delight is in your law. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is dearer to me than thousands in gold and silver. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, 
a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What gain have the worker from their toil? To have seen the busyness that God has given to everyone to be busy with. He has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, he has put a sense of past and future into our minds. Yet, they cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it is God's gift that all should eat and drink and take pleasure in all their toil. I know that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done this, so that all should stand in awe before him. That which is always has been, and that which is to be always is. And God seeks out what has gone by. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. We continue with the Benedictus. Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel. You have come to your people and set them free. You have raised the first a mighty Savior, born of the house of your servant David. Through your holy prophet, you promise of all to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us, to show mercy to our forebears and to remember your holy covenant. This was the oath you sought to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship you without fear, holy and righteous before you all the days of our life. The new child shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way to give God's people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine upon those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. At that time, Herod the ruler heard reports about Jesus, and he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. For Herod had arrested John, bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been telling him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Though Herod wanted to put him to death, he feared the crowd because they regarded him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and she pleased Herod so much that he promised on earth to grant her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. The king was grieved, yet out of regard for his oath and for the guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in in the prison. The head was brought on a platter and given to the girl who brought it to her mother. His disciple came and took the body and buried it. 
Then they went and told Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So my brothers and sisters, I thank you for this privilege to share my thoughts with you on the Gospel reading. On this morning's Gospel reading, I thank you for the opportunity and for the privilege. I do so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so our Gospel reading causes us to return and to reflect on the beheading of John the Baptist. I, I phrase it that way because it was not the actual time when John, John was beheaded. 
But at the time when Herod heard reports of the miraculous work of Jesus, but beset by what he had done to John, he remarked, this is John the Baptist. He had been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. The statement speaks volumes concerning that present state of mind of Herod. For one, he he seems unable to, he seemed unable to forget what he did to John. And secondly, he voices belief in the resurrection of the dead. Herod might not have been very far from being saved, for as we know. Belief in the resurrection of the dead is critical to the acceptance of Jesus Christ. His good news and to accepting him as our Lord and Savior and places us at the threshold of being saved. And so my friends, the time King Herod, also known as Herod Antipas and Herod the Tetrarch, the son of Herod the Great was reportedly he was reportedly a most wealthy man in Judea. He was a, he was most powerful. He had all that he wanted, probably, except at the time of clear conscience and peace with God. What Herod physically wanted, he took regardless. It might have been the stab of his conscience, his restless conscience, which, when the news of Jesus' ministry reached him, his memory of John confronted him, and he spoke what he said. My brothers and sisters in Christ, the things of which our consciences are afraid pops up at the least expected moment, but at times, it haunts us without ceasing. It is said that Herod had abandoned his wife and had been and he was living with this adulterous and incestuous relationship with his brother's father Philip's wife. But as a prophet of God, John the Baptist simply could not let this pass without rebuke. John, indignant and fearless, denounced Herod for his immorality. Herod could have had any woman in his kingdom, and yet he allowed his lust for Herodias to drive, to drive him into what was a most unacceptable and ungodly relationship. The king might have been angry enough to kill John, but he feared the rebellion from the people who acclaimed John as a prophet. His followers may have reacted. They may have reacted even violently if, Herod, if John was executed. So this, the king satisfied his rage by having John imprisoned. The irony of the situation was that John was, was trying trying to save Herod from damnation. But Herod hated him for it. Imprisoned, imprisonment and death were the recompense for this man of God who sought the salvation of Herod's soul. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias so pleased the king by her dancing that he, that he, offered her anything she wanted. Probably under the influence, he offered her anything she wanted. And so, prompted by her mother, she asked for the head of John the Baptist, here now on a platter. The scripture says that the king was grieved, yet out of regard for his oath and for his guest, he sent and had John beheaded in prison. And the, and the head brought and given to the girl on a platter. 
The tone of the writing suggests that the king's wrath against John may have somewhat subsided. And perhaps he had admired the prophet for his courage and integrity. But although he may have felt sorry for John, mighty King Herod allowed himself to become a slave to the opinion of others and a wimp to the real power in the palace, his brother's wife. Rather than acting on the truth and allowing his pride, he allowed his pride to get the better of him. And so he had John beheaded, beheaded in prison. And so my brothers and sisters in Christ, the death of John the Baptist, triggered by this great, the death of John the Baptist was tragic. But the greater tragedy was the life of Herod, which, because of his weakness, chose damnation instead of instead of salvation. My friends, it is only when it is only when we knowing, knowingly admit our weaknesses and turn to God seeking his forgiveness can we develop the strength to overcome our weaknesses and pursue righteousness in every aspect of our lives. But what can we learn from all of this. Is this just another interesting Bible story? Or is there a message somewhere in this for us? There most certainly is. And there always is. The fact is that Herod's obsession with John was a product of his paranoia fed by his guilty conscience. We cannot escape our consciences. He knew John was an innocent, God-fearing prophet. Yet he allowed his lustful desires to temporarily overpower him. My friends, weak men are always eventually victims of their consciences. Herod was so, of, so offended by John's truth that he had imprisoned, that he had him in prison. But the fact is that truth cannot be imprisoned. It may be subdued by whatever, by loss, by immorality. But when it breaks out, it challenges the conscience and troubles the mind. Truth cannot be totally subdued. The passage tells us that John's disciple came and took the body and buried it. Then they went to Jesus. They could not have gone to any better person to pour out their grief and to seek solace and to be comforted and even to be reassured and so, my dear friends, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we are hereby reminded that at times of persecution, at times of oppression, in times of suffering, in times of sorrow, we can find relief if only we'd go to Jesus. We can find comfort if we go and tell it all to Jesus. The Lord be with you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
We continue now with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again, he ascended to heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. By way of intercession, we continue to pray. Pray for God's abundant blessing upon his people. In spite of it all, we are bold enough to pray that the wars in this world will cease. That the hearts of men would soften towards you, said that, that greater understanding of what life will prevail. And we thank God for his blessings in this regard. We pray for our Anglican Church worldwide and for the well-being of the leaders of the Church. We pray for the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Most Reverend Justin Welby. We pray for our Provincial Archbishop, the Most Reverend Howard Gregory. We continue to pray for our own Diocese and Bishop the Right Reverend Claude Berkeley, thanking God for blessing him and keeping him in a way that he could that he could continue his marvelous work in this vineyard. We continue to pray for the recovery of the, the Venerable Archdeacon, Archdeacon Saul, the Venerable Edwin Primus. Pray for him that as he recuperates. We pray for all the retired bishops, Calvin and Clive. Pray that God will continue to bless them in their golden years. Today in our diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for St. Crispin's Woodbrook, for the Reverend Lewis Bailey. We pray for the Princess Elizabeth School for the physically challenged. We pray in our, in our parish, we continue to pray for the well-being of, of our parish priest, Reverend Dr. Anderson Maxwell. We pray for Reverend Presbyter Pontiflec Andre. We pray for the deacon, Mark Haynes. We pray for all the laity, the laity in the church groups that work so Assiduous, they work so continuously to do the good work of this parish. Remember the work done by our former rector, Canon Jemmet Hesewood. We thank him for his endeavors. Pray that God will continue to bless him. We bring the, congregation, the congregations of our parish before our Maker, seeking to his divine guidance and a sex and assistance to go forward with restoring that community at Oropoon. We pray for St. Philip's Lopino, Maloney, St. Aidan's, and St. Mary's. Remembering the sick in the parish, letting them know that they are not at all alone and that Christ is still in the healing business. 
We continue to pray for those who have passed in the hope that God will grant them his rest. Continuing with form A, our suffrages, we pray. Lord, reveal your love among us that we may know the joy of your salvation. Grant peace within and among all nations and teach our leaders wisdom. Endow your church with faithfulness and a servant with knowledge and true godliness. Defend the Lord the, the rights of the poor and the oppressed, that your justice may be known among all people. Lord, renew your spirit within us, that in us and through us your will may be done. Lord, God of the nations, you have revealed your will to all people and promise us your saving help. May we hear and do what you command, that the darkness may be overcome by the power of your light through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Returning to page 45, we pray. Into your hands, dear Lord, we commend ourselves this day. Let your presence be with us to its close. Strengthen us to remember that in whatever good works we do, we are serving you. Give us a diligent and watchful spirit, that we may seek in everything to know your will, and knowing it may gladly perform it to the honor and glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Prayer of Dedication Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Word. May it be a lantern to our feet, a light to our path, and a strength to our lives. Take us and use us to love and serve all persons in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us evermore. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now my dear brothers and sisters, as our devotion has, for this morning has come to an end, I thank you for having me. Let us now go in peace and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.